This is Unit 4 Access Control. We're going to deal a little bit with an XML-based access control protocol called SAML Kerberos, which is very important, uh, particularly in Microsoft Active Directory environments, and just the general concept of security domains. Overview. Once again, access controls control how users interact with systems. The subject and the object between those the access is the information passing between these. Most definitions, apart from the text, distinguish identification and authentication from access controls. For some reason, the text seems to combine these two into a single topic. How do we manage authentication and access in large, complex settings? This is the underlying theme of this whole entire mini-lecture. How do we establish trust and identity between organizations and between individuals and multiple services within the organization? How do we integrate authentication and authorization? How do we take that authenticated identity and turn it into something you're allowed to do? First topic is XML. XML is the extensible markup language. It defines a set of rules for encoding documents. Uh, it's a text-based format. It consists of uh, elements, tags, and attributes. You can actually look at the XML itself in a text editor. It's not very pretty to read, but if you know what you're looking at, you can figure it out. It's a standard used for exchanging documents over the internet. Service Provision Markup Language, SPML, is an XML-based service. It's used for exchanging user, resource, and service provisioning information between cooperating organizations. Within X SPML is SAML, the Security Assertion Markup Language. This is the actual mechanism for exchanging data between parties. One of them is a markup language. The other one actually defines what you actually do with that markup language, what sort of transactions occur between the various parties in, encoded in XML. SAML is used by many cloud services like Salesforce.com and so forth for authentication of your organization's user to a cloud-provided service tailored specific to your organization. It's how the third party knows where you're coming from and what they should provide you and what you're allowed to do. It involves an interaction between a user desiring access, the service provider, and a third party identity provider as is shown in a diagram below. Now Kerberos, different sort of thing. It provides authentication of services in a network environment. It was developed at MIT in the 1980s. One of the most challenging environments for computer security is an environment consisting of MIT undergrads. It's a type of single sign-on system. You basically authenticate once to a master server. You're given a ticket, and then given that ticket that allows you access to other services without having to sign on a second time. It was originally developed for the Unix environment, but then adopted by Microsoft when they rolled out Active Directory in Windows 2000. An Active Directory domain is actually a Kerberos realm. Kerberos. It uses a centralized key distribution center. There is one machine that hands out cryptographic keys to the clients and the servers and so forth and validates those keys. Session keys are generated at sign-on for a limited time period by limited means, perhaps eight hours, 12 hours, whatever. It's not indefinite. It's, it's changed periodically, so you have to re-sign in every so often. The user's password is used to generate their master key, which is used to request a session key. So there's a master key which is based on a password and in a session key that gives you a live Kerberos ticket for about 8, 12 hours, whatever. At the session start, the ticket granting ticket is provided. It contains a session key and an expiration time. So you're given a ticket from the key distribution center that says you are who you say you are. Here's your key, your cryptographic key you can use for all other transactions during your session and here's the time when it will expire. The ticket granting key then on is used to request services from other servers. You don't have to use your password again. Instead, you use your password once, get the TGT, and then use the TGT. You have to request a ticket for a specific service. That's why it's a ticket granting ticket. You have the TGT, then you get a ticket with a time step for a much shorter time that allows you to use a service. Say you want to use a mail server, you may get a service ticket for, oh, five, ten minutes. And then if you need another one after that, you use the TGT to get it again. Kerberos uses symmetric key encryption. This is kind of old school, uh, classic, the encrypting key equals the decrypting key encryption. The key distribution server stores all the encryption keys, and this server must be secured. This is why your domain controllers in Microsoft Windows Active Directory must be physically secured. 
Here's how Kerberos works in general. First, the client makes an authentication request to the authentication server, which oftentimes is the key distribution center and ticket granting server combined. The, that server then provides it with the encrypted client ticket granting server session key and the ticket granting ticket. The client then has that ticket granting ticket and the session key and it can then request a service ticket. It provides a ticket granting ticket back to the authentication server and it gives it the authenticator encrypted with that key. Back from the authentication server you get an encrypted service ticket. It's the client to server ticket and the client to server session key. So what you're doing is where you got the ticket granting key and the session key, you now have a service specific access ticket and a service specific session key. The client then sends that to the server, says, here's my client to server ticket and here's my new authenticator. Verify me. The service provider prov verifies these tickets in the authenticator and if everything's fine, the client then gets a confirmation with an encrypted timestamp. Bear in mind that these authenticators do not involve the user's passwords. They are derived from information contained in that initial ticket and as part of the second step there from the server to the client. Kerberos has a few weaknesses here. First off, the key distribution center is a single point of failure. If somebody can attack that, they've got your entire system. Key distribution servers, because they handle so much traffic, every time you authenticate for a service, uh, that key distribution server is involved. Scalability can be an issue, which is why you tend to use multiple uh, domain controllers in an Active Directory environment and why you might split that environment up. Secure key storage on the user's machine is assumed. If somebody can get into the user machine's memory or the location where that session key is stored, they can steal it. Password guessing. As with everything else, this is only as good as the initial password used to get the master key. Someone can guess it. Uh, they've got your session. It only secures the authentication. It only makes sure that your initial authentication to the ticket granting server or KDC is encrypted and it only secures that initial request to the service providing server. The service from that point forward is not protected by Kerberos. It has to be protected by something else. In addition to password guessing, you've got possible brute force key attacks. Even if the cryptographic key is good, it's possible uh, to go through the entire key space and find them. And then lastly, because of the use of timestamps, time synchronization is required. Somebody messes with your time synchronization, they can break your authentication. And there are some clever attacks where they reset time, roll time backwards in certain machines and extend an expired ticket out past when it's supposed to. Authorization. What comes next after authentication? We've done with Kerberos, now we're dealing with authorization. Access criteria can be defined by roles, can be defined by groups, or can be defined by other means. What you should have is a default to no access. If a particular user or other principal does not fit into a specifically defined access role or access group, what sort of access should be provided? They should be provided no access. And authorization also implies a need to know policy. Access should be granted only when required to perform authorized duties. Single sign-on is an attempt to consolidate administration of user accounts. It requires ideally only one user account, hence it's easier for the user to secure. And this is included in authorization as a topic in the book. Now security domains, we're not talking about Active Directory domains here or Kerberos realms. We're talking about a general concept. It's resources that operate or fall under the same security policy. Your security policy, someone else's, or in some cases, no security policy at all, called complete anarchy. Typically, security domains are separated by a security control device. A firewall is a really good example of a device that separates security domains. Remember, what goes on one side of the firewall and what goes on the other are two different worlds that respond to different security policies. It doesn't imply that one is more and the other is less secure. It doesn't have anything really to do with network topology. It has to do with security policies and separating differences. It's a design and policy concept. Security domains are not how you implement access control. It's how you design them and how you devise your policies for handling access. Here's one example of security domains. 
you split up a network into the internet, a DMZ, and an internal local area network. While these, in terms of network assignment, are separate subnets, you know, the DMZ may have one particular network, the LAN may have another, and the outside has everything else. Don't think of a domain as being a subnet, and don't think of it as being necessarily something more or less trusted. It's just a world where you've got different policies. You've got a security policy that applies to the internal network that defines how things are configured, how people ought to behave, what sort of things you can expect and how to react to them. You've got a different policy for the DMZ, which includes the servers that are exposed to the outside world. Uh, the policies include how these servers need to be hardened, how they're operated, what sort of traffic you can expect, what sort of traffic you shouldn't expect in a DMZ. And then lastly is the internet, which in general falls into the category of no policy or complete anarchy. Anything that possibly can happen will happen in that dark, sinister looking cloud there on the left. Another example of security domains, if you use Internet Explorer on your machine, you can go to the security tab and you'll see these different zones. There's an internet zone, a local intranet zone, trusted sites, and restricted sites. These are examples of domains and it's basically what do you want your browser to be able to do and not do if you go to certain specific sites? You know, the internet is a lot less trusted than, say, a in local intranet. Trusted sites are specific exceptions in the internet where the site is actually outside of our local internal network, but we trust it because we know that it's a trustworthy site. And unless you've got restricted sites, sites that are entirely untrustworthy, that fall under, say, a security policy of may do harm to your system. So what we're dealing with is uh, the internet which falls under one security policy. Your local network, you know, your home network or company network, which falls under a different policy. Trusted sites, which based on your policy have a different set of criteria applied in terms of security. And in restricted sites, sites that are overtly harmful. The end.